Thank you, Stephen. Um, I haven't been at this for 60 years, um, like, like Stephen, but I have been engaged in writing about, reading about, thinking about, living in, reporting on China since uh, 1997 when I stood in the pouring rain and, uh, and watched the handover of Hong Kong um, to China. I wanted to look tonight, at, as Stephen intimated, at the question of history and the legacy of history and how that shapes contemporary ideas of Chinese identity and the Chinese worldview. I want to draw on some of my own experiences reporting inside the country and some of the reading, the depth of reading that I've done around how China has emerged from the century of humiliation and how it sees that humiliation informing what it is to have a modern idea of Chinese identity. I wanted to set the scene, first of all, with when I really first got my close-up glimpse of China, and it was from the window of a train on a frozen Christmas morning. I'd lived in Hong Kong and I'd made several trips to the China mainland to report, but this was different. I was here to stay my first morning in my new home. I woke early in my sleeper cabin as the sun was rising and with the smooth of my hand smeared the condensation from the window. My family was still rugged up and asleep. They had excitedly embraced this adventure. Here we all were on a slow train. I wanted my children especially, even if asleep, to feel the movement and the rhythms of the train and the pull of the earth that would work this new place into them. The journey is part of the story that comes from my ancestors, Aboriginal people of Australia, whose tracks form a song line across country as vast and foreboding as the one that I was now in. It is in the journey that I seek permission, that I ask if this place will let me in. What was it that the psychologist Carl Jung said? Land assimilates its conqueror. We may think we are masters of all we survey, that we rule the land, that we leave our footprint. Yet with every step, the land is changing us. It was cold inside the train and I shivered a little. Steam rose from my breath and through the streaky window, I looked out on this place. China was distant and exotic and mysterious and exciting and yes, frightening. Its people had their own culture and language, their own philosophy and history. But of course, they are not just a people, but many diverse peoples. For China is not one thing. It never has been. What we now call China is the product of thousands of years of war and revolution and empire. Turmoil is a near constant state of being. The famous 14th century Chinese novel, Romance of the Three Kingdoms, opens with the line, the empire long divided must unite, long united, must divide. Empires would rise and fall, each emperor casting a long shadow, even though all around them there was treachery. For the Chinese, China was the world. They called it the Middle Kingdom, the center of civilization, and the emperor was the son of heaven. But that was long ago. This China, that would be my home, had been humiliated. It had been conquered, exploited, dominated by foreign powers, it had been weak, and this disgrace ran deep. Every Chinese child was steeped in this sense of historical vengeance. The West was often portrayed as decadent and poisonous, yet it was also something to be admired, even if grudgingly. They would take what the West had to offer, but they would always be Chinese. They would complete the great rejuvenation and return their motherland to its rightful place at the apex of global power. Over the past three centuries, the West had supplanted China at the center of the world. It had defeated China's armies, occupied Chinese land, and plied its people with opium. China was the past and the West was the future. Europeans of the 17th century could lay claim to the invention of modernity, an explosion of science, technology and philosophy that changed how we think, work and make war. Liberty, freedom and democracy were the shibboleths of a new age. To be modern was to be beyond history, in the perpetual state of new beginnings, informed by the past, 
but not beholden to it. History to Europeans was an arc of freedom and sundial of progress moving assuredly from east to west. The great 18th century German philosopher Georg Hegel believed that China was a place without history. To him, world history began only with the ancient Greeks. The West measured history in a straight line. Even catastrophe was something to be left behind. In the West, even as we commemorate old battles and remind ourselves never again, forgetting is often prized more than remembering. Not that history does not matter, but there is a place beyond history. History for the Chinese is never over. Perhaps that's the diff distance, the difference between a civilization and a nation. Civilizations have long memories and nations are all about tomorrow. That's what I saw from my train window, the space between the future and the past, between becoming and being, between progress and eternity. To stare onto a hard cracked land was comf comforting in its own way because I could see myself here, because I too came from a hard place and a hard history. Like the Chinese, I was born into a family and a people swept away on history's tide. The modern world had washed over us and we were left like survivors of a shipwreck clinging to the debris of our lives. My ancestors had been invaded, colonized, massacred, and then cast aside in a new country that had been built on our loss. What was left was an existential sadness. I could say that I shared the sadness of this land. I know what the Chinese mean when they say that they will eat bitterness. It means they will endure, they will survive, whatever the world throws at them, and it will make them stronger. I also saw a country haunted by history. This land seemed to pulse with memory. In the cold morning light with just the rattle of the train to break the silence, I could almost hear the whisper of everyone who had lived here. In the distance, I saw an old Buddhist pagoda surrounded by hills with barely any trees. And there on a flat piece of ground was a lone man working his field with a horse-drawn plough. It was Christmas Day, Christmas Day in a place where there was no Christmas. This man had lived his life under the Chinese Communist Party, which had banished religion. My wife and our boys were still fast asleep. The day before, we had closed the door on our life in Hong Kong and boarded this train to Beijing. This was the move I'd been hoping for. I was on my way to a life of adventure as China's correspondent for CNN one of the biggest network news operations on the planet. The return of China as a great power was already shaping the fate of the world. In the years ahead, it would exercise a great hold on me. It would become the defining story of my journalistic career. This country was in the midst of an economic revolution that had lifted more than half a billion people out of poverty. China was now the engine of global economic growth, the world's factory. Gone with the bicycles and old grey suits in their place were fashion brands, Audis and McDonald's fast food. The Communist Party was defying the Western liberal belief that said a country cannot become rich without becoming free. The party was instead doubling down on its power. It would stop at nothing, not even the slaughter of its own people, to keep its iron grip on the nation. All predictions pointed to China becoming the most economically dominant nation on the planet, an authoritarian superpower. As the train pulled past, I stared at this man in the field. I wondered what things that he had seen. Even from my window, just a snatched glimpse, I could see this man looked old. He had been born into a country hidden from view. The 20th century was a time of upheaval and breathtaking violence for China. The end of empire and the tumultuous birth of a new people's republic. This man had likely seen famine, mass starvation. Like nearly all Chinese, he would have been raised to revere Chairman Mao, whose portrait would likely have held pride of place on the wall of his small village home. Although from different worlds, this man and I shared a lot. Our lives stood at the crossroads of history. 
we were twinned with fate. We belonged to old cultures whose worlds had been upended by the march of modernity. History lived in us. This man had likely never strayed far from his village, yet the world had come to him as China shook itself from its slumber and began to throw off the yoke of a hundred years of humiliation. And me, I had left my country to find a place in the world and my wandering had brought me here. I swear that as my train moved past this man, as I looked back at him for one last glimpse, he stared at me. My wife soon woke and she turned to me still half asleep. Merry Christmas, she said. I looked at her and smiled then looked back out at this place called China and I heard my wife behind me, home, she said. We find ourselves now at a hinge point of history. 30 years after the end of the Cold War, there is talk of Cold War 2.0. The United States is staring down a new rival, China. We are witnessing a return of great power rivalry, yet China is economically more powerful today than the Soviet Union was then, and the United States is unquestionably diminished. China is again a powerful country, but it is still a country grappling with its identity and its place in the world. What is it to be Chinese? What is China? Empire? Nation state? Is there such a thing as Chinese civilization? Or has 5,000 years of culture been obliterated by a century of revolt? Has China triumphed over foreign domination or is it a victim? never to be healed of the hundred years of humiliation. To answer these questions, we have to look at what has shaped modern China. We have to understand the impact of history, how the grievance of history can be the iron in the blood of identity. The Chinese people have lived at the crossroads of modernity. They are haunted by chaos and burdened by history. This is what I found so intoxicating about China. It is what spoke profoundly to me and inspired me as a reporter. I was never just telling the story of China. I was looking for a part of myself. Because China stands in, I suppose, for so many of us who have felt the, wa the West wash over us like a tsunami. We are caught in the undertow of the West, which drags us to a future that the ideas of the West have created. As French historian Francois Hartog wrote, the West has spent the last 200 years dancing to the tune of the future and making others do likewise. When I looked into the eyes of Chinese immigrant workers, I felt I knew them. I'd seen that look in the eyes of my father and grandfather. I shared with them the journey from the past to the future. It is a journey those born to the West perhaps don't truly understand. How could they when the future, when progress has been a Western invention? But I've spent so much of my life reporting the stories of people on that same journey as me, people from Palestine and Iraq and Afghanistan and Pakistan and North Korea and of course, China. Existence itself in so many of those parts of the world is something we cannot take for granted. What do we leave behind? What can we carry on that journey from the past to the future? How much of ourselves do we get to keep? Or does the West demand that we put aside all of that to become indistinguishable from one another? How many of us get to make that journey? The West came to China as it came to the land of my ancestors in gunships with flags and money and progress. And yes, the promise of freedom. Freedom was the gift of modernity transported by empire and colonization. And yet for all of that, still so alluring. Mao Zedong studied the West and he drew on the great thinkers of his own country. He is the nexus between the post Qing empire China and the nation that today has returned to global power. The humiliation of the opium wars plunged China into a dark night of the soul. The Qing Empire was corrupt and weak. China was occupied by the British, the French, the Japanese. The fall of the Qing triggered rebellion, civil war and revolution. 
For China, the arrival of the West shattered thousands of years of culture and assumed Chinese superiority. Western imperialism forced change. From the 1890s, Chinese thinkers wondered how they would respond to the West. What would they keep? What would they discard? Historian John Fairbank wrote that a dominant majority civilization now found itself in a minority position in the world. A new generation of Chinese scholars, writers, and philosophers wrestled with the very nature of time and being. The collapse of the Qing Empire punctured the view of China as the center of world civilization. Western ideas of linear progress and individualism increasingly appealed to younger Chinese as they looked to throw off traditional Confucian beliefs in community, patriarchy, hierarchy. Indeed, some blamed Confucianism itself for stunting China's growth. One 19th century writer, Yan Fu, was influenced by European liberal thinkers such as John Stuart Mill and the father of economics, Adam Smith. Historian Charlotte Firth points out that Yan Fu advocated the infusion of Anglo-Saxon liberalism into Chinese politics. These were radical new ideas and shook the society to its core. As Yan saw it, people were the true lords of the world. Perhaps the most influential thinker of all, Liang Qichao, looked to the Western idea of history as a march of progress and progress meant modernization. Liang is the thinker who paved the way for those to come, including Mao. China historians Orville Schell and John Deluri have called Liang the godfather of Chinese nationalism. He looked at his nation, defeated and humiliated, and saw weakness. It was Liang Qichao who coined the phrase the sick man of Asia to describe China's fallen state. Being crushed by Japan in 1895, Liang said, awoke our nation from its 4,000 year long dream. China was no longer the center of the world. Like Yan Fu, Liang set about inventing a new nation. He especially began to show, sow the seeds of what would become a national consciousness. As Liang embraced Western ideas, he also advocated the unity of what he called the yellow race. He coined, coined a term, Minzu, to describe the people of the nation. Even then, well before Xi Jinping, China was grappling with ideas of harmony in a nation so ethnically divided. A Han majority ethnic group consciousness developed, especially in opposition to the Qing rulers who were despised Manchu, a distinct ethnic group the Han considered foreign invaders. There is much of Hegel in Liang. He believed in revolution as a force of change and that history was forward leaning. He began to talk of what he called Sin Min, a new people. Humanity, he said, is the pivot of evolution, the inexhaustible source of its transformation. Liang saw democracy and public rule as alternatives to empire. But as much as Liang imagined a future liberated from China's past, he believed that Chinese people, in his words, quote, were morally backward. By the early 20th century, the new people ideology was giving away to national essence. This was strongly racial, a pro-Han ideology and vehemently anti-Manchu. As Charlotte Firth writes, there was a strong undercurrent of solidarity with China's common people. It was in the language of today, a victim mentality that would grow into the narrative of national humiliation. Firth says the movement offered a definition of the Chinese people as a nation, an organic collectivity based upon common ties of place, blood, custom, and culture. They still recognized history as an engine of change and progress, but also affirmed the essential nature of Chinese identity. While some embraced the ideas of the West and ideas of progress, others were vehemently anti-Western and saw progress as superstition. 
World War I was critical in China's turn away from the West. The Chinese had watched as Europe had torn itself apart. Then the Treaty of Versailles added insult to China's grievances, handing Japan control of former German occupied territory in China. There could be no greater insult. China was seen as weak and impotent. Now it could not even control its own territory. It was in these moments that the seeds of Chinese resentment were sown. This was the great humiliation, a century of dominance and ridicule of China by the West. Liang Qichao, who championed progress and modernization, had now turned sour. He had been sent as an official observer to the Paris Peace Conference and now condemned the West. Following Western faith in science and progress, Liang now said, would lead China to catastrophe. As China wrestled with its place in the world, a young man who would reset the course of Chinese history was attending high school in Hawaii. Coincidentally, the same school halls that a century later, another young man who would also make history, Barack Obama, would also walk. Sun Yat-sen would be the first president of the new Chinese Republic, a man revered today as the father of the nation. Sun was sent from his village in China to live with his older brother, who had traveled to Hawaii to seek his fortune. It was a pivotal moment, one that will influence the course of history. In Honolulu, Sun attended the private Oahu College. There he took his first steps on a journey of faith, philosophy, and history that in time would turn him to revolution. He fell under the sway of a teacher who not only converted him to Christianity, but also planted the seeds of a deep mistrust of the West and America. Sun saw how the United States had annexed the Hawaiian Islands, stealing them from the indigenous people. Living in America, Sun was torn between his exposure to new ideas and new culture. He admired the strength of the West, but also the roots of his Chinese identity. He was deeply influenced as well by Liang Qichao and saw China as inherently weak. Like Liang, Sun believed in the unity of the hard race and began to develop his own ideas about what a new China would look like. After studying to become a doctor in Hong Kong, Sun returned to Hawaii and built support for armed revolt back home. He was banished from China and spent 16 years in exile, traveling between America, Japan and London and visiting cities like Sydney. The West was strong, he said, because it had power and wealth. He believed that the West bullied China and that Westerners, quote, were ready to pounce like tigers on the rest of the world. More than ever, Sun was convinced the corrupt Qing leaders must go. Battered by war and rebellion and occupied and humiliated by foreign powers, its territory carved away, the Qing Empire fell. And Sun Yat-sen was appointed the first president of the Republic of China. He didn't last long in office, just 45 days, but Sun would set the course for the nation. He laid out his guiding principles for the rejuvenation of China, nationalism and the struggle of the people. For Sun, this wasn't just about saving China as a nation. He believed he was saving the Chinese people from extinction. From the time of the Opium Wars, a new generation of Chinese had seen themselves as locked in a battle against Western dominance. As much as they admired the West's strength and studied its great thinkers, they knew that the West held China in contempt. As Sun said, the rest of mankind is the carving knife, while we are the fish and the meat. We face a tragedy, the loss of our country and the destruction of our race. Two men would emerge from Sun's shadow to finish what he had started, Mao Zedong and Chiang Kai-shek. Chiang not only fought under Sun, he later married the sister of Sun's wife. Chiang had also spent time in Japan and studied in Moscow. And like Sun was torn between a grudging admiration for the West and a desire to rescue his own country. Although they fought each other, Chiang and Mao were united in their view 
of the Western world. Chiang felt deeply the shame of China's defeats by foreign and Western powers and those treaties that had carved up Chinese territory. The treaties he believed kept the Chinese in quote, bondage. Shell and Deluri wrote that a smoldering anti-foreignism is everywhere in Chiang's writing. In one diary entry, he wrote, the stupid British regard Chinese lives as dirt. The intensity of China's shame and anger can never be underestimated. Chiang and Mao, like Sun Yat-sen before them, never forgot that they were fighting on multiple fronts. They fought the enemies at home and the enemies abroad. Mao Zedong's communist revolution was a peasant's revolution. He wrote that China's peasants would rise like a fierce wind and that no one could suppress them. They would accomplish, he said, what Sun Yat-sen had failed to do. They would send all the imperialists, warlords, corrupt officials, local bullies to their graves. Mao fought with the gun and the pen. He had been a librarian and had spent his days lost in words reading the classics. Close friends say he was obsessed with the histories of ancient China and Western philosophy. Like other emerging leaders of China, Mao revered Liang Qichao. Mao's biographers, Alexander Pansoff and Stephen Levine wrote that Liang Qichao's book on renovation of the people was a treasure trove of knowledge for Mao. As Liang wrote, he wanted to search for the primary cause of the decay of the Chinese people to avoid future disaster. Mao's exhaustive reading did not lead him to a more liberal or democratic view. To Mao, China had fallen because the Chinese people were ignorant and weak. He famously compared them to a blank sheet of paper. Mao would write the future and the people would follow. As China scholar Roderick McFarquhar wrote, Mao believed China needed to be destroyed to be rebuilt. Mao Zedong gave China back to the Chinese people, but at the cost of blood and misery. His was a permanent revolution, government by chaos. The death toll of Mao's war and revolution is immeasurable. Just between 1958 and 1962, the period known as the Great Leap Forward, Mao's vision of mass industrialization, it meant that at least 40 million people were estimated to have perished. Yet Mao, for all that Chinese see him as the redeemer of the nation, did not deliver China to global power. Instead, it was Chinese communism's embrace of capitalism that powered the great Chinese economic revolution. It was Deng Xiaoping who, after Mao's death, opened the country to the world and set China on a course to usurp the United States as the most powerful economy on the planet. Xi Jinping is where Mao and Deng meet. Xi is poised to lead the country back to its place, as he sees it, as the greatest power in the world, the place it lost after the fall of the Qing. In an article published in 2016, Xi Jinping, history cannot be denied. He writes, to destroy a state, one must first erase its history. The hostile foreign or interior forces that often write about the Chinese revolution and the new China, never cease to attack, slander and tarnish. The principal objective is to confound the Chinese people. Xi portrays China as a victim of the West. He knows that his narrative has a powerful hold on his people, and I have no doubt that he believes it, but it serves another function. In a country that is fraying at the edges, where many are left out of the China dream and are angry and alienated, Xi knows that he can always exploit this sense of nationalism. He will never let fade the memory of the opium wars and he knows that to win the hearts of the people, he must inhabit the spirit of Mao. Xi Jinping has a tiger by the tail. He presides over a schizophrenic nation that is neither truly communist, and if capitalist, then certainly not liberal democratic. That is strong, yet paranoid, rich, but not free. 
C is battling corruption and enemies within the party and navigating a world where some countries may accept accommodating China's power, but most resist Chinese hegemony. At home and abroad, China resembles what the US-China scholar Susan Shirk once called a fragile superpower. And everywhere, there are the ghosts of history. The fall of the Qing Empire haunts China still. And the modern day emperor Xi Jinping knows how quickly kingdoms can fall. The French philosopher Jacques Derrida spoke of those he described as having the bread of apocalypse in their mouths. They are, he said, the people formed by history, haunted by history. Derrida asked, what does it mean to follow a ghost? We are persecuted, he said, by the very chase we are leading. The future comes back in advance from the past, from the back. History stalks us. Throughout our world, there are those who have known darkness, who carry what the Polish poet Czesław Milos once called the memory of wounds. History becomes the wellspring of identity. And at its worst, it can pit us against each other. As the Indian philosopher and economist Amartya Sen once wrote, identity kills and it kills with abandon. Sen had seen the violence of Hindu and Muslim in his own country. For a bewildered child, he wrote, the violence of identity was extraordinarily hard to grasp. These are the conflicts of our time. These are the conflicts that I've reported in 40, in 40 years of journalism, from Africa to the Middle East, Northern Ireland, South Asia, China, North Korea, conflicts rooted in history. Islamist militant and white supremacist both drink from the same poison well of history and identity. The identity warriors embrace identity of victimhood while also promising to restore lost glory. There are no shortage of populist political leaders who wrap themselves in history and identity. In Russia, Vladimir Putin speaks of the collapse of the Soviet Union as the great catastrophe of the 20th century. In Turkey, Recep Tayyip Erdogan laments the fall of the Ottoman Empire. Donald Trump came to power promising to make America great again. And Xi Jinping pledges to avenge the hundred years of humiliation. We cannot understand China nor begin to negotiate the impact of its return to global power without fully appreciating the depth of that history and the pull of identity. It is one of the virtues of liberalism that history like tradition need not chain us to the past. As an Aboriginal person inhabiting my own history, I have looked to that as a way of releasing myself from the bonds of that past. Yet that great virtue can also blind us to the lure of historical grievance. Liberalism is seen as a place beyond history. Indeed, as Francis Fukuyama wrote with the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, it is the end of history itself, but not in China. When I was living and reporting there, it became ever clearer to me that if we are to understand this vast, heaving, contradictory, complex, inspiring, maddening country, we need to grasp three things, history, homeland, and harmony. And we need to see these things through modern China's three most powerful leaders, Mao Zedong, Deng Xiaoping, and Xi Jinping. Mao was the revolutionary communist leader who saw his mission as reviving a fallen, humiliated nation. Deng Xiaoping came to power in 1978, two years after Mao's death. He had fought alongside Mao, forged by the same resentment at foreign occupation and vowing to, offend China, to avenge China's humiliation. Deng's biographer, Eric Vogel, describes how Deng as a young man 
traveled to France and during a layover in Shanghai, saw white people treating Chinese in their own country as if they were slaves. Working in France, he saw how European imperialists were humiliating China and Chinese workers were treated worse than local workers. Living abroad, Deng Xiaoping discovered Marxism and became a hardened communist. From the humiliation of history, Deng dreamed of the revival of his homeland. Deng conceded his nation had to change and set it on a course of economic revolution, but at the same time, doubled down on Communist Party power. The party and the homeland would be inseparable. To history and homeland, Xi Jinping adds harmony. He speaks of the quote, harmonious society, an idea that he has inherited from his predecessor, Hu Jintao. But where Hu saw harmony as political reform and social justice, Xi Jinping means stability. In the name of harmony, he has cracked down on dissent, jailed dissidents, rivals, lawyers and journalists, enacted harsh new laws to stop protests in Hong Kong and locked up over a million ethnic Uyghur Muslims in what human rights groups have called re-education or brainwashing camps. If it is harmony, it is harmony by force. China's most dominant leaders, Mao, Deng and Xi, have told us how they see the world and China's place in it, how that is rooted in history. And that's where diplomacy begins, with a clear understanding of the country that we are dealing with. How our words are heard in China, how China sees the world, how China sees the West, and how it is still informed by the fall of the Qing Empire and knows full well that empires can indeed fall. To understand China, to understand that history, to understand that sense of identity gives us a framework for dealing with China's rise. Not a framework of appeasement, not a framework of just accommodation, but a clear headed view of how China sees the world and what it is to be Chinese after the hundred years of humiliation. The question then is whether or how we can live with it. Thank you.